Good morning. It's Reverend Michael Capron. We have uh, a text today from John 5 and then uh, a sermon looking at this fascinating story. Here we go with the text. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else comes and gets down ahead of me. When Jesus said to him, then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath, and so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, The man who made me well said to me, Pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, Who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. This ends our reading. Our series uh, that we're doing right now is called Narrating Your Story, where we look at stories from the Bible, which can be interpreted in more than one way. And today we look at this very sick man from John chapter 5. We're going to look at his story twice. First, we're going to look at this story as an interaction between two ordinary persons, a sick person and a caring person. Then we are going to look at it as an interaction between a sick person and and the Son of God. For our first pass, I'm going to use the Spanish pronunciation Jesus instead of the more familiar to me, Jesus. And then when I go back and start over, I will begin talking about Jesus, the Son of God. So, first pass. Some regular guy named Jesus comes into the city gate to this unusual place with many stone columns and a pool of water and a lot of very sick people. We don't know what time of year it was, but let's assume it was July and quite hot. These sick people are desperately staying near the water, crowded together. The smell is not pleasant. In addition to using the water for drinking and maybe a little bathing, the sick people were crowded together because there was a story about this place. Supposedly, an invisible angel would blow on the water, making ripples. The first person to get into the water after that happened would be healed. There is a man there who's been sick for 38 years. It will help if I give him a name, so I'm going to call him Harry. The text calls him an invalid, so I'm going to assume he has a condition that impairs his ability to move. We don't know what that is. Maybe a stroke. Maybe the result of a back injury. Maybe he had polio. When Jesus walks into this scene, he does not do what I would probably do. He does not freak out and keep his distance while going around the smelly crowd. Instead, his gaze passes over the crowd and then snaps back to focus on Harry. This is the first miracle of the scene. Jesus saw him. When you are a person who is down and out, who feels stuck and has little hope, what a blessing it is to have someone actually see you, to acknowledge you as a person, to pay attention to you. Jesus goes and speaks to Harry. He asks him a question. Do you want to get well? If I were Harry, I might have answered with biting sarcasm, possibly laced with profanity. But Harry does not. As lonely people do, he's relieved to have someone listen to him. And so he tells his story. Sir, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. What a sad story this is. 
he is sick, so he can't move very fast. And since he can't move very fast, he can't get into the pool after the angel blows on the water. So not only is he sick, but it is his sickness that prevents him from getting well. And I have to believe that this cycle has left him feeling a bit hopeless. Although we do know that he's been sick for 38 years, we do not know how long he's been coming to this pool, but I get the feeling it has been a long time. He may be hopeless and despairing, uh, meaning he may feel utterly hopeless in the face of his illness. It is possible that he believes there is no hope for him. Or alternately, it may be that he's just become passive. He still believes that he might be healed if he could be the first one into the pool. But he doesn't try very hard anymore. He never makes it. So why, why work so hard? This is a better condition than being utterly hopeless, but not by much. In this second mode, he has diminished hope and his will is weak and he's just no longer really trying. It seems like our friend Jesus believes that the second mode is the case because of the masterful question he asks, do you want to get well? Harry's answer is revealing because he just keeps fo fixating on the idea of the pool. It no longer occurs to him that he may have other options. Since we're pretending this is Jesus rather than Jesus, I wonder how the story goes from here. It is reasonable to suppose that Jesus would pray with Harry. After all, Jesus has already taken the most important step. He saw him. He saw Harry, saw his humanity, saw his pain, and listened to him. He's gotten to know the man, conversed with him, and asked him if he wants to be well. Several people in my church have read Richard Foster's wonderful book on prayer. And um, on the chapter in Healing Prayer, he gives some steps. Perhaps Jesus will follow that outline. Step one, listen to God. This is the step of discernment. Step two, ask God's healing to come. This is the step of faith. Step three, believe. This is the step of assurance. And step four, give thanks. This is the step of gratitude. Please notice that you give thanks no matter what the outcome. Our prayer is not conditional on God performing what we want God to do. We give thanks regardless of outcome. Miraculous cure, we give thanks. Small change or even no perceivable change, we retain our attitude of gratitude, glad that God is with us. And sometimes the healing can be subtle. I don't think I've ever prayed with anyone in this church and seen a flash of light and a miraculous healing in the moment. But many of you have expressed appreciation for my prayers and report that in some way they work. I'm a little nervous about that word, but I appreciate what is being said. And I am grateful for the many ways that God is with us. Let me return for a moment to Jesus' question. Do you want to be made well? I found an article by Reverend David Lee Jones in which he gives an excellent example of someone who does not want to be made well, and I will read to you from his description. Two policemen brought to the crisis center a 27-year-old handcuffed woman who had violently busted up her mother's home. Lorraine had a swollen black and blue eye. At first she refused to talk, but then offered conversation in exchange for loosening her handcuffs. She eventually opened up to her own surprise as a level of trust developed between us uh, through the evening. She had been drinking heavily and admitted to daily alcohol abuse. She was an only child and her parents separated when she was two years old. She began drinking at age 20 when she discovered her mother was a lesbian. She admitted to deep-rooted anger, resentment, and hatred toward her mother, but she also wept and said that she missed her and loved her dearly. She admitted to being severely beaten by her boyfriend on at least 10 different times. Lorraine avoided responsibility for her life by blaming her problems on her mother, father, boyfriend, or anyone else. Her violent attacks on her mother's home reveal her intense rage related to unsuccessful attempts to change her mother. Although able to admit having multiple problems, she refused any help. 
When I tried to clarify her situation, she diverted the conversation to avoid focusing on herself. Lorraine's diminished hope is evident in statements such as, I don't care if I live or die. I don't care if I get beat. I don't matter. And even God doesn't care about me. David Lee Jones asked, do you want to live better than this? She replied, no, I don't need any help. Every form of help I offered was batted down, says Jones. Her mother, who threatened to press criminal charges, was willing to drop them if Lorraine accepted professional help. Lorraine was adamant. I'll rot in jail before I go to any damn hospital for crazy people. And that is what happened. She went to jail instead of accepting help. Sad. Narrating our own lives is tricky narrating other lives, other people's lives, is nearly impossible. What's unusual is that Lorraine was given such a clear choice, except help or go to jail. That might have been the clearest moment of decision in her whole life. Yes, she exercised her will, and she made her choice, sad though it may be, but she also did do that in a larger context, right? She, she was in these circumstances. She used her circumstances, though, as excuses. But it is worth reflecting that, like all of us, she operated in a context of relationships and temptations. Abuse and addiction will affect anyone, and ending such things should not be spoken of lightly. Healing is long, arduous, and getting there may be quite painful. I feel sadness and compassion for her. But let us pass on from Lorraine now. Let us also dispense with Jesus. Let us return to Jesus in John 5 and consider how the situation changes when we assume that Harry is speaking to the Son of God. You remember the two greatest commandments, love God and love your neighbor. They are similar. Loving neighbor has many things in common with loving God, but they are not identical. Encountering God is not the same as encountering our neighbor, even when God arrives in the form of Jesus. Later in the story, the Jewish authorities see the healed man carrying his mat on the Sabbath and complain. They want to know who told him he could do that. Like his answer to Jesus' question about whether he wanted to be healed, his answer is evasive. Uh, the guy who healed me, whoever he was. Let me read you verses 14 and 15. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. The man had thought he was talking to another human being that he was in a neighbor-neighbor relationship. Perhaps he, he even thought he'd somehow gotten away with something, uh, obtained a healing miracle on the sly from a faith healer or something. Perhaps he thought it was time to lay low and keep a low profile, but Jesus will have none of it. In our relationship with God, there is a covenant between creator and created, between divine and mortal, between worshiper and that which must be worshiped by its very nature. I believe Harry's sin had little to do with his physical condition. The sin Jesus warns him about was not correctly recognizing the kind of relationship he had and needed with God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Great list. It encompasses the whole person. In fact, the key question Jesus asked the man back in verse 6 might be better expressed using the language, do you want to be whole? And it's significant that that same word for wholeness is repeated in the passage five times, verse 6, 9, 11, 14, and 15. It is a thread that links the miracle story together and emphasizes the point of this miracle healing the whole person in heart and soul and mind and body. In verse 15, the story concludes when the man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. How will you narrate your life? It is up to you. 
but I urge you to narrate, remembering that it's all connected, our physical health, our relationships, our families, and God. Don't tell your story omitting any of those things. I hope that you can sincerely thank God for your life in the context of loving the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And I hope that you notice that despite the hard parts, you have much to be grateful for. Amen.